Uh, good evening and welcome to the Orange County Historical Society. Thank you all for coming tonight. We have a great program and Linda Shea is here from Brea and um, looking forward to this. Um, wanted to make a few announcements first um, about uh, society business. Uh, first of all, next month is going to be our Authors Night program. We've already got a pretty good uh, roster of authors lined up. We have uh, topics running the gamut from uh, the history of Irvine Ranch to the Jewish experience in Orange County to Not Scary Farm to uh, 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 Father Junipero Serra's time in Orange County to uh, uh, the, the history of San Juan Capistrano, um, uh, some of the early pioneers, and uh, even radio in Orange County. So it's a, it's a real mix. There's something for every, everybody. And so we'll have a whole panel of authors are each gonna talk. If you haven't done this before, they each come, they each give a quick introduction to themselves, uh, to themselves and their books. And then there's opportunity to sign and sell and you can, uh, they can, uh, you can walk around, buy books, browse through them, talk to the authors, ask them questions. So it's always a fun evening. And being in November, it's you know a good time to be thinking about buying gifts for the holidays too. So um, we have that going on. Um, and then in December, uh, we will have Andy Schmidt here talking about the Southern California Landmarks Project. Um, those of you who are on the uh, Orange County California History Group on Facebook will be familiar with Andy's work. Um, and that uh, he is doing a tremendous job going around documenting historic sites throughout Southern California. And uh, it's, it's pretty impressive, both the history work uh, end of it and, and the photography. So it's a great combination. Uh, and so we'll find out more about what he's doing and why. Um, also want to mention, since we were talking about books a minute ago, many of you know Harriet Fries, who uh, uh, staffed the check-in table here for many years, was on our board, um, and uh, before that her, uh, her husband uh, J.J. Fries was on our board, and, and a lot of us knew him as well. Um, she, is, uh, she is doing well, she, uh, but she is not as mobile as she used to be, and she says to say hello to all of you, since she used to say hello to you every second Thursday of the month. And um, she is uh, also <laughs> all of what was Freeze Pioneer Press. All of the books and materials ended up funneling, what's left is all funneled down to her. And so she is donating all of these unsold copies of all of these books. And there's a lot. Um, uh, we, we spent a Saturday with four volunteers that down there just pulling stuff out and we're putting it into our storage and we're going to inventory it and then we're going to make it available for sale and get these titles, some of which have not been in circulation, local history titles uh, since the 60s or 70s in some cases. So a lot of great material. So um, anyway, we thank her for that and we're looking forward to being able to get more of these books out into the hands of people who want to know about these parts of our history. So um, that is happening. Um, also, uh, Rob Brown is here tonight and he is working with us on a, um, he's been doing a lot of good work out at uh, Majeska's Arden, out of Majeska Canyon. And uh, he is working with us to put together an event to celebrate the birthday which uh, we have the, the 100, 185th birthday of Judge Pleasance, who was one of our founding members. He was one of the early pioneers of Orange County. Uh, he had a hand in all kinds of you know, firsts in Orange County. You track down the history of so much that happened here, and he's got a hand in it early on. This is a guy that was part of the Wild West, and that's part of why it's so exciting. Uh, this is a guy who fought off packs of wolves here in Orange County. Uh, this is a guy who was involved in shootouts with desperados. This is a guy who was, uh, you know, just had a hand in everything. And, and this is the fascinating part, the, the thing I've always loved best about Majeska's Arden is she bought Judge Pleasant's house and she added on to it. That's what's there today, that beautiful architecturally wonderful home is all centered around an er one of the earliest pioneer cabins in Orange County. 
And if you go in there, you can still see Judge Pleasant's home. And we're going to be we're going to be interpreting that that day, and we're going to be I'll, we'll be I'll be giving a talk about Judge Pleasant's and this incredibly colorful character who lived um, long enough that he became the source for early Orange County history. You would go to Judge Pleasant's and talk to him, and our members did uh, pretty regularly. Terry Stevenson, he was a major source for Terry Stevenson and some of the early members of the society in writing their histories. Uh, so. It's going to be a fun day, you know, it'll be birthday cake and all the birthday stuff, and it'll be a lot of history about early Wild West Orange County. So that's going to be uh, March 30th is what we're shooting for at the moment. We have to get final uh, approval from Parks because it is their property, but they're mostly on board and we just have to check off a couple boxes, but we're, we're on the road. So that's coming. We're also starting to talk about some potential history hikes. And so those are kind of starting to take shape. So just know that they're coming and there's some pretty interesting ones with some great stories behind them that we've got in our hip pocket. So not quite ready to pull the trigger on those yet, but they're coming. Um, that said, um, I also want to mention if you uh, are not up on your membership, uh, we are taking memberships. Uh, go and see Aida back there at the orange table. And uh, we also have a, a bunch of our publications, including I believe a few new ones we don't normally have out. Uh, we've been expanding our stock of local history books. So there's probably some stuff you haven't seen uh, back there tonight, uh, including some material on Brea. So um, do sign up for a renew your membership or sign up for the first time if you're new or what have you and, uh, and check out the books. So with all of that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, old friend of mine, Linda Shea. She's executive director and curator at the Brea Museum. And uh, she's lived in Brea since 1996 where she raised her three sons and has four grandchildren. She holds a BA and MA in history and a PhD in education. Besides her work at the museum, Linda is also an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland where she teaches several courses covering the history of the 20th century. So with that, I'd like to welcome Linda. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the walker. I am at the end of my hip. I have hip replacement in two weeks. So, yay. So I'm going to stand as long as I can and then I'm going to sit. But, uh, so thank you very, very much. Um, I'm sure like most of you, you call Chris at a whim. You need a, a map. You need a document. You need a file. And he finds it. Maybe you need a racially restricted covenant. And he finds it anytime you want. So when you get a call from Chris at 7.30 at night, you know it's payback time. And so uh, I have one check mark off the I owe you one, Chris. So, so tonight I'm here to talk to you um, actually from the Cultural Arts Commission. I am the executive director at the Brea Museum, but I'm also on the Cultural Arts Commission, and we are the advisors to the City Council on all things cultural in the city of Brea. And if anybody can't hear me, just raise your hand and I can shout louder. I'm from New York. We shout, so no problem. So how do you make it go? <laughs> it's, the middle one. it's not the middle one. It's not the middle one. Make it go. <laughs> Soon we're gonna go. I'll just sit down there and okay. Pants. All right. Okay. Yay, technology. Making our lives better. Every moment of the day, twice on Sunday. Oh, and I just broke your thing, too. Shit. <laughs> Don't record that. <laughs> okay, so today we have 191 monumental statues in the city of Brea. And tomorrow, we might have 192, but we will definitely have 192 by the middle of next week. And they are monumental works of art because they are large pieces. They are visible from the street, they're visible from the parking lot, they're big pieces of art. And they are works of art because the artist says they are. 
And the artist sometimes holds that opinion in solitude. Some people don't believe that they're works of art. Um, you can forward ahead. Like these. These are very popular on Nextdoor. They were just recently installed across the street from City Hall, and they're about plant parts, but they were offensive to many, many people. Um, <laughs> but, next slide. This one wasn't, apparently. Now, this looks exactly like what you're thinking. But when you go up close, and you're probably to be too humiliated to go up close, because who wants to go close to that? It's not doing that at all. So I have a quote from the city, and I just have to read it. Um, you see Gustavo's little quote there. Gustavo likes to write about the city of Brea. Um, now he's writing for the LA Times, so he doesn't write about us as much. But he describes this piece of art between Cyprus and Ash, and that's exactly where it is on Brea Boulevard between Cyprus and Ash. The city on their website describes this as internal spring, a painted bronze vertical sculpture depicting a muscular male figure standing nude with a wrap around his legs, twisting and partially kneeling. Internal spring is located on Brea Boulevard between Imperial and Lambert. Clearly the city doesn't want you to know where it is. But if you do want to see it, it's best to view going north because you would have to turn around going south and once you see that, you can't unsee it and you'll probably drive into a pole. So, <laughs> next. Regardless of what the community thinks, the art program continues on and on. And since 1975, we've amassed a lot of statues. Go on. Now, when Chris asked me to do this, he asked, what are you going to speak about? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to think about that. Well, I need to know by Thursday. Okay, I'll call you tomorrow. And so I sent him some stuff, and I said, I'm going to talk about art in public places. Well, you know, Linda, this is a historical society, and we do history. <laughs> so to that end, we'll do history too. Really advance it. See, we all have to look at you now. Oh, it's trying to update. <laughs> oh, God. Technology, improving our lives. Every minute and every second. Or you can just leave off the picture of Chris. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we know uh, I'm from Brea, and Brea originally was not there. But everything happened in Olinda. We kind of started in Olinda. Now we know oil was discovered long before 1898 and our native, native people were using the tar, the asphaltum from the hills long before 1898. But for the sake of brevity, we're going to agree that in 1898, oil wells were established in the city. And that's the village of Olinda. And they were established in 1898 because by that point, the technology had greatly improved. They were able to really drill down further. <clears throat> Excuse me, the other wells that were out and about weren't as productive. So more, uh, more wells means more oil workers, more oil workers mean more families, more families, more building, more building, less space. You can go ahead. So it didn't take long for the village of Olinda to become a very thriving community. Uh, there was stores, there were schools, there was the railroad, there was a social hall, and there was, of course, baseball fields because baseball was extremely popular. And they were pumping out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of barrels of oil. In fact, at one point during the early 20th century, that whole Puente Olinda oil spread was producing about 20%, they say, of the world's oil. Put it in context. Next slide. The other thing they produced was this guy, Walter Johnson. Now, Walter Johnson moved there from Kansas when he was 19, and he and his family lived on the Santa Fe Lees. He played semi-pro ball for the Olinda oil wells, and we still have a team called the oil wells. He attended Fullerton High, though he did not graduate, because at 19, he was already recruited by the Washington Senators, where he would play his entire career. 24, he won the World Series, which is why he came out here. Anaheim had the great big parade. He and Babe Ruth played the game, blah, blah, blah. 
His fastball, 91 miles an hour. He held the strikeout record all the way up to Bob Gibson in 79 and then Nolan Ryan in 81. And he's one of the first five inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. He's one of the five immortals with Cobb, Matheson, Wagner, and Ruth. So Olinda was producing great things, but it was really getting packed. And of course, if you've ever been on an oil lease, you know it's noisy, it's dangerous, and it smells very bad. So this guy, W.J. Hole, had an idea. Now he was an agent for the Stearns Ranch, and he was going to create another little town. He had just created a tiny little town over in La Habra, and he was going to do the same over in what was going to end up being the town of Randolph. He had a flat plateau, and he had really, really important friends, Huntington, Chaffee, realtors Isbell and Greg, and he was going to make this community. All he needed was water and the rail. You can go again. And we'll just skip ahead and presume, yes, he got that. He got the rail with, of course, the, the red line. Randolph, Epps Randolph was the vice president. Oh, we're moving around. I'm having a stroke. And of course, he got with, uh, water with East Whittier land and water development. So the town of Randolph was born, and that's what we were, the town of Randolph. And it was small, about 230 lots. And it wasn't easily found, apparently, because it was like, where's Waldo? Can't find it. But uh, he promoted it pretty heavily, and it wasn't very successful. So a few years later, he files another map in 1911 with the county, and he changes the name from Randolph to Brea. And Brea, of course, as you know, is tar in Spanish. Why he chose that name, we do not know. There are about 15 different stories. But the very same day, he also filed the second map, which Chris created for me one day, put the two maps together. So he had the original town of Randolph map, and he filed that little tiny piece on the top, and that became the town of Brea. And that's what we would be until 1917, when we were finally incorporated with all 732 of our population into Orange County, the eighth city actually incorporated into Orange County. So history done. Moving ahead to 1975, and we have an art and public places program, but we don't actually have it yet. We have somebody who had the idea about public art, basically started it with a handshake, and that is not a lie, and maybe a little bit of subliminal suggesting, and of course there's a story. So the story is Wayne Wedeen, who was then city manager at the time, had just returned from a trip with his wife through Europe, and he was just amazed at all the art, public art, that was all over the place, and he thought it was beautiful, and it was drawing people, and he thought, we could do that in Brea. Why can't we do that in Brea? Why would we do that in Brea? Because this was Brea in 1975. Now that doesn't look like a very inviting artsy place. <laughs> the Brea of the early days was kind of like an old town. Oh, what does she see? <laughs> no, wait, go back. <laughs> huh? Running joke. Okay. <laughs> yeah, oh. Okay, so storefronts faced Pomona Avenue, which is now Brea Boulevard. Parking was in the back. And this was it. It was very um, Midwestern, if you will. Not really very inviting. But Brea had one thing most of the other cities didn't have. And we had over 330, maybe 35 square miles of undeveloped property that was part of Brea. And that made all the difference in the world. We had lots of land in which we could develop, turn it into something. So they came up with the idea, okay, we want to do art, we want to develop this land, we need a policy. So this is not an ordinance, this is not a resolution, this is not a, a city bill, this is just city council saying, yeah, we need to create this, you know, this community arts and cultural planning program, and we probably need a policy for it. So two weeks later, city council created this policy, and they are going to now have an unofficial official guideline 
to direct developers, and most specifically, Wayne Wedeen. And I call your attention to the very bottom where Councilman Waddell suggests that the mayor look into the possibility of establishing a cultural committee in this community similar to the beautification committee. Mayor McCain said that we do have a cultural event in this community at this time the high school production of Brigadoon, in which Councilman Waddell's son is a cast member. Now, who knew that a high school play was actually a cultural event? But we had one right here in River City, and it was gonna be part of our program. So you can move on. But he's the brainchild. This is Wayne Wadeen, he was the city manager. He had a vision of what Brea would become. And I say would and not could because it was going to become what he envisioned. It was not a can be, maybe, should be. It was going to be. And it would be much more than Pomona Avenue. And it would be much more than public art. He was basically thinking in three different directions. So the city, in order to you know, get the pump primed, they bought the first piece of art. It's called Swinging a Child. It unfortunately has been uh, demolished. <laughs> but it was in Arrow Vista Park for many, many years. And they bought it with the intention of showing the community and the future developers that this was a partnership, <coughs> that you would be working in partnership with the city to develop this new community. It was not gonna be like the old community, it was gonna be new and invigorating and it was going to be cultural and it was gonna include a lot of art. But that wasn't all of it. He was going, as I said, he had that trifecta, three directions. So he said, we need a destination, we need a reason for people to come here and see the art, not just the art. People just don't come for art usually. And we had just gotten two exits on the freeway, literally between Lambert and Imperial, for real. <laughs> and so he's like, well, we can make the city money if we get that mall and put it in that space. Now, he was already courting Homart, who was going to be developing a mall in the West somewhere, probably between Arizona or California. But Wadeen was going to make sure that it was not just California, not Orange County. It was going to be Brea. And we got them all. And it says it was going to open in 76. It took a little while. There were a few little snafus. But we were getting them all. But there were problems. Um, not everybody was pleased about getting a mall. First of all, there was the concern of traffic. You know, Brea didn't have a lot of traffic. They didn't have a lot of commuting and such. So a mall was gonna bring a lot of traffic. And there was congestion that's gonna come with that. And why do we even need a mall? We have a great downtown. There's all these beautiful shops that have been here for decades. And anyway, who gave him the permission to keep going back and forth to Chicago to get this permission in the first place? And who's paying for his wife to go along and eat those dinners? So there was a lot, a lot of controversy around this. And this was probably the biggest. It was the emotional attachment to the downtown. Uh, this beautiful picture from the early 60s is very reminiscent of the picture from the mid 70s, which is very reminiscent of the picture from the early 80s. It was very slow change. It was a downtown and people were attached to it. It looked basically the same. Many of those buildings were from the 10s and the 20s. Uh, in deplorable condition. As you know, Brea went through a, another period where they put false fronts to kind of mask themselves. But you can go ahead. But we had years and years of growth, but it was very, very moderate growth. So this was our downtown, and you know, our, this was us. It wasn't a lot, but we were gonna make it better. Go ahead. So regardless, we got the mall, and it opened in 77. Now, if you notice along the very bottom line where it says, we got them all in that straight line of traffic. That's actually State College Boulevard. And it's not the State College you know today that's going by the mall because today's is curved, seriously curved. And it wasn't curved until they decided they were gonna get another anchor store that was gonna come with a big old parking lot and they were going to have to move State College Boulevard. So that had some overruns. Wayne thought for sure it was going to cost him his job. It didn't. and. Um, it delayed things a little bit, but the mall did eventually open. 
go ahead. And still, art is being installed every day, a new development, every day, a new statue. Some are beautiful, some are recycled, some are, I don't know, a knot. I don't know. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> so this was the third leg of the trifecta. He had to get something really big to anchor the whole idea of a cultural community. And that was going to be the Civic Center. And Brea, at the time, the government offices were over in the old City Hall, which is in City Hall Park. And so it was small. Um, it's a national uh, historic landmark, but it was a very small building. But it contained everything. But this was going to contain a theater and a gallery and the library. In fact, Brea has the first branch library in the Orange County system. And it was going to have the police and the fire and the school district and civic organizations and everything would take place here. And so it did. And this doesn't look exactly like the artist's rendition, but this is certainly the center. Right behind is the mall. Embassy Suites is off to the left. And this photo is from before the solar panels were installed. We now have solar panels that cover the, the plaza on the the Pacific Center, but this was going to be the anchor. So there was a reason for people to come to the city, the mall. There was a beautiful Civic Center that people were going to engage in the arts in other ways. And then of course there was all this art all over the city. But the community wasn't very pleased again. They kind of felt like they were being held against their will. The Civic Center controversy was pretty bad. There were allegations and there were conflicts of interest, um, misappropriation of funds, city corruption, the list was very long. Wayne was sued, he actually went to a jury trial which eventually was acquitted, but it, it caused a lot of commotion throughout the entire community. But still, the art is coming along, we're still getting statues and pieces, and not only just statues, but pieces that are installed on walls and in communities. Go ahead. From 1975 to 1984, we ended up with 54 pieces of work. Monumental pieces of art, because the artists said they were, without an ordinance, without a resolution, without a law, without anything in writing that said you had to do this, except our little guidelines that said, wouldn't this be nice? This would be good. Only one developer ever questioned why they were doing this, and they did it anyway. So then in 79, we said, okay, now we need a group that's going to help gel all this together, somebody that will advise the, the city council on cultural things and how we can expand even further. So the Cultural Arts Commission was developed, and believe it or not, they went through three meetings to decide five members, seven members, seven members, five members, three members, 12 members. We have five members. Go on. And still more art, each piece, each week, each month, a new piece of art. Now, Wayne Wedeen was city manager from 68 to 83, and he was the one who was managing this program. He was the one who was meeting with developers. He was the one who was convincing them that they were partnering in the development of this really great city, that they were going to be on the ground floor, that they were going to be part of something. This was their legacy, and a statue in the front of their building was a lot better than the billboard they'd remove when construction was done. But he was going to be moving on. He was going to retire. And so the city was like, ah, what do we do? So we couldn't lay him on a Xerox machine, and he was a little bit too big. So we created an actual ordinance. And now we have a real etched in stone ordinance. And it's gone through a few you know, ramifications. At first, we just presumed that the developer would be there forever and ever. That didn't work out. And that they would always take care of the art. That really didn't work out. So we've made some final adjustments. And still more art, more art, more art. Now when the dust had finally settled about the Civic Center and the mall and the downtown was now starting to deteriorate, 
we would call the Brea Blightbusters, they were going to make sure that this was really worth coming into because the downtown still looked like it did in 70. They were a little bit less appealing. And so Clarice and Carrie walked around town and they decided blight, rad blight, minimal blight, not so bad, got to go throughout what ended up being about 60 acres of the downtown area. And they were going to redevelop it into a new heart for the city. Now, is this Brea Blight? I don't know. These are old buildings, again, many of them from the early teens and 20s. Um, a lot of gray, <laughs> a lot of brown, but it was a functional city. It was a functional downtown. The really sad part is the neighborhood. This is where the Ralph Shopping Center is, the gateway. Um, this is a very large community, over 300 homes, and this was their prime target. This had to go fast and furious. And this was probably the worst contentious point of the entire redevelopment. This basically took the cake of all the controversy in the city. Um, we had the charrette. A charrette is where they drive people around and they say, hey, look at your city, envision its future, what do you say? And they had conferences and they had classrooms and workshops and surveys up the wazoo and you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of information gathering. And at the end, not a lot of the person's input. The people didn't have as much input in the final product, and so they felt the charrette was a sham. Uh, the city pushed out the Mexican population. And that is true and not true. Um, the area where the gateway is was the oldest section in the town. When it was the town of Randolph, the homes were being down, brought down from the lease and installed in this very tiny section, those you know, 230 lots, that was part of those lots. And so those homes were older, early 1900s, 1910s and such, and the homeowners, as Union Oil annexed property into the city, homeowners upgraded, moved out, rented those little homes over in the gateway. And so the predominant demographic was Mexican, but honestly it could have been kangaroos. They were going. It was that space that was going. But it wasn't handled very well. We had, uh, an, they believed in the abuse of eminent domain. A lot of eminent domain was used. Um, almost 95% of the homes were destroyed. Um, a lot of loss of historical buildings, a lot of loss. Some of them were removed over to Redwood. We tried to create this little historic district, but um, it was pretty sad. Four of the five city council members were sued. Um, one of them owned about 12 properties in the gateway and changed title to his, his family <laughs> in a last minute effort. One of our council members was indicted. The city was investigated by the FBI. These were good times in Brea. Great to be alive in the city of Brea. It was wonderful. Um, and yet the downtown, the finished redevelopment is one of the best in all of California. It has won numerous awards, including the California Association's Redevelopment Award, the Economic Achievement Award, and a half dozen others. It's taught in architectural classes because it came in earlier and under budget. How on earth, we don't know. <laughs> And still the art was coming. So despite everything, despite as pissed off as people were, we were still getting art on every single development. So today, developers are pigeoned in. They have one of two options. They either install a piece of art or they donate to the art fund. And it's gotta be an original piece of art, not something that you're gonna recycle. We have one of those. Um, it's 1%, 1 percent, 1.5 million to 399. So 1.5 will make a $15,000 piece of art. That's nothing today in development, as you know. But installation is on the developer. <laughs> Ordinance 1050 makes all development in the city subject to the arts program. So either you put in your art or you put in the money. 
but it's one or the other. The art fund will be used to purchase art for public exhibition by the, the committee. Nobody, uh, with the exception of a few outside interests, have ever even blinked an eye at this. And again, this is 1% of a big development that's generally going to make Bach. Uh, Bray has got a very high property value. So what they're putting in is really a drop in the bucket. That's what we tell them. <laughs> that's my pitch. So now Bray is getting really serious about the arts. We've created, and we're in the process of creating a cultural arts master plan. And we've engaged with Arts OC to help us create a steering committee and come up with ideas where we can expand the arts programs even further. Um, right now, the art in public places, again, we have 191, soon to be 192 statues, and we're only 12 and a half square miles. So at some point, we're gonna run out of space. But there are other ways that we can install art. We can have rotating exhibitions. We can have art within public buildings. We can have different kinds of art, not necessarily monumental work works of art. So if you go on the city's website and find the Experience Brea page, go back, dude. Oh, Lord, where are we? I don't know. <laughs> you can find a survey to take. And whether you live in Brea or ever drove through Brea or just work in Brea or still come to the mall, please engage in the survey so that you can share your your insight, your, your wisdom, what do you think we should do with art and not art? Now you can go. So this is where we were. This is you know what Brea was down on the bottom. Thanks to Google, that's what we see today up on the top. Things have changed, lots of things have changed. Lots of things have stayed the same. The Welcome to Brea sign you can still see up on the top. It's, it's still there. Of course, the Downtown Association put a little sign on top saying downtown welcomes you, but you know, whatever. We have a lot more trees. In fact, we're a tree city USA. And folks still complain. They like to do it on next door and you know, social media. And of course they come to the museum and they complain like it's my fault. <laughs> Move on. And guess what? <laughs> the art still follows and goes and grows. And you can go on. So this is what Wayne Wedeen lived in. This is the home that he had in 1975. You can go on. But this is what he saw. Go ahead. Thank you. And thank you all for what you do in saving history. I broke your thing. Oh, sure. I'll take questions. I'm going to sit. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it has to go within public view in front of their development. The developer can suggest a piece of art. It has to go before the uh, Cultural Arts Advisory Committee and then they approve the piece of art. And it has to meet certain criteria. I don't know what the criteria was with internal spring. Uh, something went wrong there. But we don't have any more internal springs like that. And uh, we have a few plant parts, but the developer can input. But usually the developers don't have much insight into art. They generally hire an art contractor. Oh. And that's on them as well. And it has to be approved. And it has to meet the dollar amount criteria. They can't just have a plain front. No. They have to incorporate a piece of art in front of their. Design. Or they have to donate to the art fund. That is correct. Yes. Hi. When was the decade, approximately, where all the work bubble happened with you know, the other the FBI? Well, the redevelopment was in the early 90s. And uh, in 78, we started with the Civic Center. And so it, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we got kind of crazy about that and Wayne going back and forth. The mall was 70s. He went as early as 72 back to Chicago to kind of court Sears to get a, an anchor store before we even started approaching home art. Yes? You, you touched on it a second, but the maintenance, maintenance 
Today, today the developer is required to maintain the property and there is a contract written in their selling of the property that the buyer now takes on the responsibility of maintaining the piece of art. It's, it's got to be maintained in perpetuity. We've just done a survey of all uh, 109, we were 190 when we did the survey. And some of them are in pretty interesting shape. Uh, the one over on Point Day across from the Albertsons Distribution Center is being impacted by carbon monoxide from the trucks. So, and then somebody in their wisdom thought they'd go there and wash it, but they could only reach that far. <laughs> and so from here to there, it's a little bit blue. And then from there to top, it's kind of not. Um, but we, we're working with the developers to remind them that this is their obligation, that they are, you know, beautifying not only the city, but creating a sense of pride for the community. And I have to say, um, it is really extraordinary driving around Brea and seeing all this art. And some of it, depending on your mood, you look at it and you think, <laughs> what is that? And then in other times you look at that same piece and you think, Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm feeling like that today. You know, so it's just subjective. Yes? Um, from a preservation standpoint, um, I can't help but cringe at what happened to your downtown. And yeah. Uh, really remarkable that um, Bray got away with what they did because it was without a doubt an abuse of sequence what was done and you could never ever do that today no you're right yeah it was it was a very very controversial redevelopment but to the city's credit a lot of those buildings were absolutely in deplorable condition they were termite ridden they were falling you know they were built in the early 1900s sam's place lovely sam's place which reeked of urine and vomit um just was falling apart. And so the hope was to create a heritage center over where the Ash Street cottages are. Uh, right in there, they were gonna put the Brea sign back on you know, the stanchion and they were going to put in Sam's Place and the Brea Hotel and you know, a few of the other buildings and create this heritage center. But there was no income to drive it. There was not going to be anything that that could support itself from. So uh, the city decided not to. And you're right, it was an abuse of not only CEQA, but <laughs> an abuse of people. People lost their property. They took one piece um, right on the corner of Imperial and Brea Boulevard that's now a jack-in-the-box, but it's been vacant for 10 years. So that's got to piss you off when your house is taken and there's nothing there for 10 years. You know, but um, it's unfortunate uh, that it is gone, but it is gone. Is still alive? Yes, he is, very much so. Uh, I bother him I weekly. I on the Redevelopment Commission in Santa Ana. He gave, he, he, we went on a tour of Brea with him. Yeah. And, um, I mean, he, uh, he guy was a visionary. No yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, and he wanted to make money for the city. He wanted the city to become fiscally independent and strong and you know that trifecta approach, the civic center, the mall, you know, and the art did that. Brea has a, a very high standard of living. Um, we live in the bubble, you know. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I can attest to that. We were talking about that when you drive between Bray and Fullerton, you certainly can tell the difference between yeah. road, road quality. Yeah. Uh, road yeah. Uh, take care of that. Which piece of art you might have already told us this, has, has generated the most controversy? Um, Was it the one that you showed? Okay. Yeah, those two. Um, then there's ones right across from the deer. There's two. I call them the tuning forks. I don't know what they are. They're, they're light green metal things, and they're huge. And you wouldn't even know what they, that they were part of the art program unless somebody told you. And they're just ugly. <laughs> they look like rebar or something. I don't know. They're I just. I thought the one in front of Dr. Shoe's office, the dental office, was pretty. 
disgusting. The torso that was... Yeah, the chained. chained. That came in with a lot of controversy because of the color. Yeah. It was, and you know, Brea has a great, great reputation for things of color. So, you know. But I didn't talk about that tonight. <laughs> yes? Is there uh, on Brea website someplace that there is. If you go on, yes, there is. If you go on the, the museum's website, we have a narration. Terry Sullivan and Dina Summers took it upon themselves over the years to photograph all of this art, and Terry narrated. He's got a great voice, and he narrated the descriptions. And he gets a little lengthy, you know. He goes into the artist and you know what they were doing, and I don't know breakfast, all the whole kind of stuff. But it's really informative. But the city has just completed a GIS format on their website, Brea Art and Public Places. In the city of Brea Art and Public Places, because sometimes Terry's stuff comes up. Um, and you open it up, you can expand the map, and what you are seeing on that map shows up on the side panel, and it has a description. And the description of Internal Spring is what I read from the city's description. <laughs> a little bit different than Gustavo. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that the first actually piece of art has was demolished. Yeah. And why was that? And have there been other pieces that have been demolished? Yeah, we've lost probably about 40 pieces over the years. Uh, yeah, because a lot of artists came in with bronze. Not a good thing to come in with because bronze has a tendency to walk away. Um, we had one, it was a great guy. He was sitting on a bench reading the newspaper. His briefcase was open on his side. The whole thing got taken one night. You know, it was like, what the heck? And rumor has it that the head was found at a, you know, a metal shop and maybe that's right, I don't know. But uh, the one in Aravista Park was cement and skateboarders used to go on it and kids would climb on it and bang on it and you got to stop that dude. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know. Oh god. pox on him. <laughs> but um, unfortunately we have suffered theft and of course cars. The centennial one that was at Lagos de Moreno uh, within three weeks after being installed was plowed in by a car. Uh, the deer over by me up on Berry and Northwood that's been demolished three, we are two times. This is our third. Uh, now we put big boulders in front of it. We moved it back about three feet. But um, for the most part, because they are in public, uh, and now with cameras and you know all kinds of other security features, it's, it's much better. Believe it or not, we haven't suffered graffiti much. We don't suffer graffiti much in the city anyway. Um, but. Yeah, people are people. We have people in Brea. Would you believe that? <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I have a question for you. Does anybody remember the mayor who had that revelation that a school play was actually cultural experience? Anybody remember his name? No. Start guessing. I said it. I said the word loud. <laughs> Yes, it was. What? It was McCain. And you get that. <laughs> Bray a bling. Well, that's okay. I lived there for 30 years. Okay. Well, I thank you very, very much. And I hope you will come to Brea and visit the, the art and the mall. You know, the mall is going through a major redevelopment. It's going to be amazing. Um, green spaces, living, breathing, working, the whole nine yards. So, fun stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Oh, and I have something for you. Oh. <laughs> Oh. And then this one is for the archive. Oh, thank you. Take a tour of Brea's Art and Public Places. This will be in our archives. So. <laughs> and I'll also mention we have a few books about Brea, starting with, we just have one copy left now of Art in Public Places, a self-guided tour through the city of Brea. It's an oldie. <laughs> Still on the back table. And uh, a collector's item to you. Yes, of course. Uh, and we have three copies left of Kenyatta de la Brea, Ghost Rancho by our own Virginia Carpenter. And we have one copy of Esther Kramer's.
Brea, City of Oil, Oranges, and Opportunity. Great book. And that is, of course, the big co-buster on Brea, but it, it's, it's really a great definitive work. And, and uh, so Excellent. we have one Excellent. of those left for sale as well. They'll be at the back table. So anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. I hope to see you at Authors Night next month. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, do help yourself to goodies in the back. And also, please do drop your name tags off at the back on your way out. And uh, when you get that far. So thank you all so much.